You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. Be cautious. Um, never assume that everything is okay. This is not a job for predisposed attitudes about people or about the job. And it's the unknown, um, I think, that adds the stress. If safety's important to you, it's not going to happen on its own. How we carry ourselves is the key to our safety and achieving our goals. That focus is probably the most important part of personal safety. Our goal should be to, to help the defendant and to go home safely at the end of the day. Someone once said that um, your best tool or defensive tactic is, is your mouth and your mind. Losing focus, I think, is the thing that creates the danger. When you lose focus of where you're going, your surroundings, and you're preoccupied, that's the danger. Thinking about things beforehand, I think, to me, is common sense. What am I going to do if? If this happens, what's my plan? If, if that doesn't happen or something else happens, if there are more people, should I stay or should I go? I need to be aware. I can't be thinking of what I need to stop at the store to buy on the way home. Do I have some type of mechanism that if I need to leave the situation, if I think it's dangerous, can I leave? Am I aware of what tools I'm taking into the field? Are they, are they working? Are they functioning? And do I have the paperwork I need? Am I ready to do that? Have I read up on who I'm going to see? Do I know where they live? If I have the opportunity to go over all of the addresses and people that I want to see on a given day, that day prior to actually making the visits, to sort of think it out, to try to think up negative things and how would you handle them. And planning those things out in advance rather than just showing up and dealing with people. Live from the Federal Judiciary Studios in Washington, D.C., the Federal Judicial Center presents Safety Series. Scenarios for Officer Preparation. Moderating today's program, Mark Maggio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's program. I'm Mark Maggio, and this is the second program in our uh, FJC Safety Series. Uh, the program today is going to focus on officer preparation strategies. Now remember that back in December we did our first broadcast in this new safety series and that focused on mindset, getting that mental processing aspect out and talking a little bit more about uh, what was involved there. And now for the second program we're getting into officer preparation strategies that takes us to the next step and begins talking about how that mindset then translates to behavior and with respect to uh, our personal safety and how we conduct ourselves on the job. We're going to be using a new format for today's program that will be uh, supported through tape, the use of tape scenarios. We've got several uh, that we're going to show you through the course of the program and uh, the discussion will be uh, facilitated by our lead panelist, Art Inouye. But the format, we'll use a debriefing format, very similar to the type of format that many of you are experienced in using both with the Applied Officer Safety Program that we've done, with, which is scenario-based, and running your own safety academies in your respective districts. Many of you do this sort of debriefing format. Well, we're going to convert that and do that here today uh, in terms of, of uh, talking about the scenarios that you'll see. We're also going to use this format in our upcoming third ser uh, program in the series, which it will air on September the 19th, and also in future programs that we'll be doing in fiscal year 03. Um, let me uh, say something else before I move into our, uh, introducing our panelists that I certainly would be remiss if I didn't say. Uh, this program was developed, as, has, uh, as was the first program, by using an, an advisory, safety advisory committee from the field. A number of folks that uh, many of, of you are watching today um, are experienced instructors and practitioners in this field and have done, have had years and years of experience in safety uh, under your belt. These are the folks that we've used in the advisory committee to help develop and, and craft this program into something that we hope you'll find meaningful. And uh, 
it, it couldn't happen without them. So we really think of this as more of an, uh, a program by officers presented for officers. So um, let, me just, let me just highlight that up front. Let me introduce now our panel who's going to uh, lead us through this discussion today. And we've got some of the heavy hitters uh, on a national perspective with regards to the topic of safety. Our first uh, panelist is Art Inouye. Art is a safety consultant and retired supervising U.S. probation officer from the Eastern District of California. I've had the pleasure of training with Art in safety-related settings for a number of years, and Art is nationally recognized as one of the gurus in this topic, in this field. Uh, next, we have uh, Connie Smith. Connie is a Deputy Chief U.S. Pretrial Services Officer for the Western District of Washington. Connie, as well, has a lot of years of, of safety training under her belt, and uh, was one of, the, one of the districts first in the country that really got the scenario-based training underway in their own district and started doing the academies, very similar to the folks in California Eastern. So we're, we're real privileged to have Connie. Uh, and certainly last but not least is my friend and colleague, Art Penny. Art is a supervising U.S. pretrial services officer from the District of New Jersey. And like the other two, Art has years of experience teaching safety and instructing not only for his district but also for us here at the FJC uh, on a national level. So we've got a, a, a well-experienced group of, of panelists that are ready to uh, carry you through the discussion. Now, before I turn it over to Art, Art's going to be leading off each debriefing and will um, talk a little bit about, you know, give you a nice lead-in as we begin that discussion. He's also going to be bringing in our push-to-talk sites, and we have six sites on board with us today. And uh, what Art is going to do is going to divide up. We have the first scenario, he'll go to three of those sites, and then the second scenario, he'll go to the other three. And he'll identify and introduce those sites as he goes along. But the push to talk sites that are with us, um, Art's going to be calling on you guys throughout the program, just as if you were a panelist here in the studio. Uh, many of you have, a, again, a lot of experience in this field, so we're going to be drawing uh, quite a bit on your expertise. So get ready for that. And also, our push to talk sites, if you hear one of our panelists bring out an issue or maybe in response to a fax question that we get, uh, feel free to jump in and um, comment on it, raise a question, disagree if you have to. Uh, we want to hear it all. But again, your, your input will be extremely valuable. And speaking of faxes, for our view-only sites, well, you've got the ability to fax questions to us as well, and we certainly want to hear from you during the course of the broadcast. And you'll see the fax number appearing in the lower third of your screen. Finally, we've supplied you with some training aids, uh, discussion guides um, for, your, for your review after the broadcast, and you can get additional copies of these which are available on our website. And again, that address is appearing now on the lower third of your screen. Okay, um, I'm going to toss this over to Art Inouye. Art is going to review the debriefing format for you and then uh, introduce our first scenario which deals with individual officer preparation. So Art, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark. I want to tell you how happy I am to be part of such an important program. It is a part of uh, all of the skills that you learn, the broad spectrum of things you have to learn uh, to do your jobs. We're going to suggest here that uh, learning to be a safe officer is as much a skill as anything else you do on this job. What we're going to do is go into scenario training. This and the sec second of the series of officer safety programs. And we're going to take another step. We're going to use scenarios. And in that process, we're going to use a debrief uh, program uh, that will allow us to move in a different direction uh, and discuss things that uh, are as essential to coming to conclusions uh, that you need to come to in the safety arena. We're going to be analyzing each scenario, as we usually do, uh, uh, by looking at the safety issues. Uh, some of the lessons that can be learned from uh, digesting and, and taking apart uh, what happened in this scenario. Uh, but in addition to doing that, and the push to site uh, folks will give us a, a, a lot of information, illuminate a lot of ideas, uh, will be giving us uh, things to talk about. Our panel will go even further uh, or will uh, ask questions and uh, discuss things with, uh, with you. But what we're going to do is then is to, to extrapolate lessons learned, those academic conclusions that we can make clearly from what we've seen, to 
how can we apply these to our circumstances at two levels? One, on the job, when we go to the field, when we're in the office, what, what kind of uses can we put, uh, put these lessons learned to doing that can be constructive for us? And once we identify those things, the next level that we really need to examine is, how does that fit for us, for me, as an individual? You see, personal safety is just that, very personal. Each of us is as different as our fingerprints when it comes to putting together safety, personal safety. It requires a commitment and an understanding of yourselves. Those of us who have engaged in experiential training know that despite the fact that we might have specified, specialized training uh, and some very dominant beliefs, we don't always act the way we think we're going to act under those high ten intense and the real circumstances. So what it takes, though, is for us to revisit those and make it part of us, make it part of the fabric of your safety foundation. And the pieces that you put together are dictated only by your understanding of yourself. No one else can do that. And once you start doing that and start understanding that it takes a commitment to take in principles learned in training. Your subject matter experts, some sitting in your rooms right now, have put in a lot of time, a lot of years in developing uh, these safety principles. They're, it's a sophisticated process. We all know uh, and, and have heard these classes, but the screen by which we see this is, is based on that fabric, a, a commitment to learning, to accepting the idea that I have to learn these things and make it part of me, an automatic reaction, not something that's in my head that I think I know. It is part of my normal process. It will happen because I've trained myself to do that. This is going to be an important part of starting. We're going to talk, we talked in the last series, the last segment about mindset. That's where everything starts, and we're going to revisit that here as we go. So we're going to move into the first scenario with that in mind. And we're going to go to the push to talk sites and we'll talk to the panel and try to flesh out all of the issues that arise out of this scenario. You'll notice it's a one person scenario where a person's in the field and you'll see a lot of familiar circumstances. So with that, let's roll the first one. When I get into my vehicle or when I'm driving along, I start to think about each individual stop and to visualize what I know of this individual. If it's a new case, uh, what I know of the individual uh, by way of the written material in the file. Yeah, Simon here. Hey, Janice. No, I'm not on my way in. I'm out in the field this morning. Can you get my email? Oh, network's down. Oh, great. No, I have to stop at January House first and uh, check on Anthony Waits. And then I got a few more folks to check on. Uh, I should be in around 11. Yeah, would you let them know I'll call them when I get in? All right, thanks. Anybody else looking for me? <laughs> All right, like I said, it shouldn't take too long, so, uh, uh all right. All right, thanks for calling. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Hi, this is Larry Simon with the Federal. Hey, Cindy. Hey, how you doing? Uh, good. Look, I'm supposed to meet Anthony Waits at your place at 8.30. Oh, he's there already. Oh, great. Hey, do me a favor. Yeah, let him know that I'm on my way. Yeah, I should be there on time, but uh, traffic's a bear right now, and I don't think fate's on my side. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, 
Africa. Simon. Hey, sweetie. Yeah, I know. Pick up Josh after practice. Hey, look, I'm kind of in a hurry. Can't this wait? Uh, all right, I'll take care of it. Hey, well, gotta go. Uh, all right, I'll call you later. Bye. Change? Uh, no, uh, but a soup kitchen with a good breakfast is up around the corner on top. Oh, thanks. Mr. Simon, hi, how are you? Oh, fine, too busy as usual. Well, when you have a chance, can you stop by my office? I need to talk to you about Jamie Pollitt. Well, sure, I'll stop by on my way out. D but if this is going to take more than a few minutes, I'm going to need to reschedule for a better time. Oh, no problem, thanks. Okay. Mr. Waits, good morning. Sorry I'm so late, but you wouldn't believe the traffic out there. It's about time. However, um, all is forgiven if you got it all worked out. If I got all what worked out, Mr. Waits? My visit request, what'd you think? My baby's sick, remember? You said you had to approve the visit because her mother's got her in another district. You were gonna see to it that I could go. I never said that. Like I told you last time, it's not so simple. I said I would Man, have to look into it. Man, I don't believe you. How long have I been waiting to see my kid? The one little thing I ask you to do. What's wrong with you? Look familiar? You bet. But before we go to the push to site, uh, push to talk sites, uh, want to introduce uh, the districts involved uh, uh, that will interact with us uh, on the analysis of, of the uh, scenarios. Uh, from the District of Kansas, Jeb Blankenship. From Kentucky Eastern, Tony Jocelyn. In California Eastern, Bruce Vasquez. They are moderating uh, a group uh, gathered, assembled at locations uh, in their districts uh, to respond to the scenarios. So let me go in that order. Jed, what are your observations, your, you and your group, uh, of the safety-related issues here? Good afternoon, Art. We are... Um Looking at this, uh, understanding that we all go through these situations in which uh, there are several things going on in our day-to-day -day lives, but uh, one of the things that's important to do in a situation like this is to refocus and gather yourself before you meet with an offender. Uh, be aware of the case. Be aware of the issues that are going to be discussed during this meeting and uh, and be prepared. Think some things through, uh, put everything out of, your, out of your mind and focus on the issue at hand. Right on the money, Jeb. Good to see you, good to hear from you. Uh, your group uh, came right through and, and plugged in those essential kinds of things that every officer should have in their process of, of starting out the day. Um, and that's a good one. Uh, let me go to uh, the District of Kentucky. Uh, Tony. Well, I think we noted that this individual probably has too much personal life involved in his professional life. And, you know, to eliminate some of those stressors to begin with, he can just say, you know, honey, please don't call me at work. It's going to be a busy day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one officer mentioned they can just go ahead and turn the cell phone off. Also, you know, they need to just go ahead and allow for more time during their scheduling. Um, if an individual feels as though they're going to be late in meeting with somebody and they know that the client's background, they know their past history, um, they know they have the opportunity to get, to, uh, get somewhat impatient, just say, look, you know, um, go ahead and meet with your counselor, and in the future, possibly later this week, we'll go ahead and reschedule. Uh, Bruce, in California, same issue. What are your observations regarding the safety-related oh, issues? How are you doing? 
Good. Uh, one of the things we focus on here in our group is, is making sure that you allow a little extra time when it comes to, to doing our visits. And we, we focus on the idea that he obviously has a lot of distractions, as many of the other uh, uh, speakers have talked about. And we basically felt the most important thing he could do is, is make sure he stays focused and uh, assure that he allows maybe a little extra time, maybe starting off a little bit earlier in the morning. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I know the Eastern District of California has extensive uh, experience at analyzing scenarios and, and working their way through it. The, the three districts here, uh, I know the moderators all have uh, a variety of uh, a deep experience in, in officer safety and uh, will come up with these things and, and will help us as we go. I'm going to turn to the uh, panel right now, but I'll ask that uh, as we go along here that the push to, to talk site folks, each location, uh, talk amongst yourselves with regard to the scenarios, uh, because we're going to move into some questions that uh, delve in a little further. So uh, let me go uh, to our panel, and, and I want to first talk to Connie. Uh, what are your observations regarding the issues and in, in the comments made by the uh, groups? Or the thing that I heard, there's a common thing, theme amongst all the uh, push-to-talk sites, and they use the word focused. And in order to gain uh, that focus-centered feeling, I think that a number of things need to occur regarding preparation for mindset. Uh, we're obviously all very distracted. Uh, we've got busy lives, and there's a lot of stressors on the job. Uh, and some of those you might view as uh, manageable. Well, you're behind on a report. You're trying to meet a deadline on a pre-sentence. You need to get a violation report out. You're behind on your chronos. You're behind on your emails. All these things, uh, you might have some conflict in the office going on. All these things create stress. Then you're in a situation where you're going out into the field. You're carrying all the stress with you. Uh, one thing that I try in my life to work on mindset is to focus on what's most important to me in my life and what I want to get home to me home for, for myself. I want to get home to my husband and my children. And am I going to take risk in my job that's going to jeopardize that? And it's, that forces me to refocus uh, every decision that I'm going to make. Good. That, that's, you heard Connie uh, revisit the, the issue of mindset. We're going to tell you now that that's where you start. That's where every officer should start is the mindset. If you don't have one that's put together uh, based on your, your own beliefs and understandings and have been put in, putting the issues related to that mindset to the test, then you, you, you will have holes in your approach to safety. And, and we're going to be pounding that drum as we go along again and again because it is essential. That's where we start. That's how we get to where we are with, as safe officers. It is important that you put as much effort into obtaining that information and, and clarifying that as you do any other skill that you have on this job. So, Art, can you expand on what we're talking about in this? Sure. I think one of the things that really stands out in this scenario is this officer's unpreparedness. You know, he doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a course of action that he's going to take. He doesn't have a purpose for what this contact is. He forgot what the nature of the contact was going to be, that he had an issue that he was going to try and, and deal with with the offender and his total lack of awareness of his environment. Uh, you know, the contact doesn't start when you get to that defendant. The contact starts as soon as you go in the field. And all that scenario around there has to be taken into play also. So he's got to be more prepared of, of what's going on in his environment. He's got to know more about the history of the offender, his family, and so on and so forth, and know what issues he's going to have to possibly deal with when he makes that contact. Preparation. Absolutely. Essential. And, and that preparation has to come automatically, doesn't it? It has to be something you do regularly on, on each case. And, and it all relates to safety. If you don't have it together when you go to the field, uh, there's going to be times when you're caught unprepared. Push to talk, folks. I want to go to uh, Jed. Uh, can you elaborate more? Uh, do you, are there um, other improvements uh, in the performance of this officer that you can suggest uh, that will help prepare an officer in this uh, kind of circumstance? One of the things that, that I think is important is that each officer goes through a, a transition period uh, before they meet with their defendant. And, and they need to transition from whatever they were doing prior to the meeting 
to the task at hand. But I, I believe everyone uh, who's commented on this has picked up on, on the essential um, important things in this scenario. Uh, Tony. We all agree that time management was the, um, the primary key here. I think he could avoid that confrontation with his offender had he, uh, I guess, gone ahead and scheduled ahead of time and just said, you know, let's, let's um, reschedule for later on today. I'm going to be late. Um, is that going to cause a problem for you? He needs to make sure that the, um, his offender realizes that he's going to be late, and if he's on a schedule, then he needs to go ahead and accommodate his schedule also. Uh, Bruce? Are we focused on, on the appearance that the, the officer appeared to not to be familiar with his case, and we felt that there was a need for him to know the case a little bit better before he went in there and, and know the expectations of the offender before he walked in the room. We also focused a little bit on the hands-free option of the telephone. We were a little bit concerned that an officer in our district would be occupied by using his hands on the phone, and we're pushing heavily in this district to get the hands-free option of, of phone usage. Good point. Real good point. Let's talk about what we've been referring to uh, before. Uh, I want to hear from the Push to Talk sites about mindset now. After looking at this scenario and, and uh, being illuminated uh, in the previous uh, segment, uh, expand on the mindset, uh, your understanding of mindset and where, how that plays in, in this kind of uh, thing with regard to safety. I think we all agree that mindset is the key to, um, to handle any situation. The way you prepare for a dangerous encounter is going to directly be proportionate to the outcome of that encounter. So mindset is the key. Preparation is the key. Everything that we've already touched on in the past, knowing your itinerary for the day, um, having time management, all those factor in. Thanks, Jed. Your, your group will uh, lay the foundation for us to go further. And, and with uh, Tony, I'd like you and your group to give us an idea of what we mean uh, about uh, why is mindset so important, so central to what, what we do subsequent to, to anything. I think the main reasoning behind these scenarios and the main reason we're here today watching this video is to better prepare our officers for confrontational um, encounters with their offenders having good time management and again once you said uh, the whole the whole mindset issue mindset is the key once you prepare for a dangerous encounter you're going to eliminate uh, more potential for a negative situation the more prepared you are thanks tony we, we have layered now on why it's so important uh, bruce how do you make it an important part of your your persona uh, because we're saying that it's central to everything we do. So, uh, Bruce, in your group in California, can you tell us something about mindset, how we get there? All right, we've been talking about how the mindset controls how the, the contact goes. It can escalate or de-escalate what the offender, how he's going to represent you. And as far as mindset, I think as the panel has said earlier, it's a safety is a personal issue and, and anytime we walk into our job we feel it's critical that we take responsibility for assuring that we're going to be safe in what we're doing and that's a mindset issue thanks bruce and that that that, that just focuses for us where we need to go next because there's an issue regarding uh, demeanor in this case isn't there and i'd like to start off with our panel and ask them their observations regarding demeanor because uh, that, that layers on top of our mindset, doesn't it? And where that goes uh, is important when the outcome is affected directly by it. So I'll, I'll ask uh, first Art, uh, Art Penny, what are your views with regard to demeanor in this case? I think demeanor is real important in dealing in any kind of safety issues that you're talking about. How you treat a defendant could escalate or de-escalate a situation. Uh, I think a good theory to, to practice by is you treat people with respect and dignity, and you treat people with the way you'd want to be treated. Um, you know, by going in with a, uh, a predisposition on somebody about how they 
uh, how you expect them to be. In other words, if you have somebody with a, a, a violent history or so on and so forth, or maybe the offense that they're, they're arrested for, and if you have a pre-diagnosed disposition about them, you may act differently than you would if you didn't. So going in there with those kind of attitudes or a negative attitude could heighten or escalate a situation. So you really don't want to use those type of tactics. Connie? The only thing I have to, to add, Art, would be um, I know people frequently use the word respect, and sometimes I think they confuse that. They state that, well, I, I don't want to, I don't respect this defendant, so why do I need to be respectful? So sometimes I try to move away from the word respect and utilize the word courtesy. We're an extension of the court, we're an arm of the court, we're hired to be professionals, and with that comes courtesy and respect for an individual. If not in what you feel about the person, how you're going to treat that individual. Uh, and I think when you utilize this as a safety technique, you'll find that um, your chances of remaining in a safer situation will really be increased. If you give an attitude, you're going to likely receive one back. And I think Art has stated it uh, very candidly uh, that you treat someone the way that you want to be treated. I think if you find yourself in frequent uh, arguments with defendants or offenders, um, or you have your defendants or offenders becoming very agitated or aggressive or defensive with you, you need to do uh, a self-analysis of your own style and possibly get your own ego in check. Thank you. Push to talk sites. Talk. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm the demeanor is an important uh, part, and I'm, I'm curious about uh, um, what, that, what, what role that plays uh, uh, in addition to what has been said by the panel and how you, you view uh, demeanor and, and its role in, with us in the field and, and go back to what you really believe a demeanor should be in the field or anywhere else in our job. And so I want to start, we'll, we'll use the same sequence. So Jed, I'll ask you and your group to comment on uh, demeanor, which is a, an important thing to examine. Art, one of, one of the things that I think about demeanor is um, uh, it starts with the very first contact you have with these, uh, with these individuals. And each contact, you set the stage for the next contact. So that's an important part of, of just the overall safety mindset. If you leave your previous contact, in an agitated state, the next one may very well pick up in an agitated state. Uh, one of our one of our uh, panel members here brought up regard for the defendant in in trying to work with them to uh, help them alleviate the problems that they're having in this particular situation, uh, and letting that person know that you're going to uh, try to uh, rectify this situation. Um, at that moment of that contact, the person that you're contacting should be the most important thing on your mind at that time, uh, uh, nothing else. It should be something that uh, is all part and parcel of what you do and how you do it, isn't it? We are a direct arm of the court, and it, from the first contact throughout our uh, association with defendants and offenders, um, it, it means a lot. Uh, and, and if, if we get into uh, arguing or, or, or getting mad at uh, offenders and defendants, uh, we lower ourselves uh, to, their, to that level and, and lose our professionality. Um, there's a, there is a demeanor that we can talk about and, uh, and should understand. The root of, of, of where it comes from and, and where it goes from there, the, both push to talk sites have pointed out the importance and how it works. Uh, Tony, I want you, to, you and your group to tell us uh, more about what, what uh, you've talked about in, as far as demeanor is concerned. Okay, Art, thank you. I think um, we all agree that demeanor is extremely important not only for the officer but also for the offender. Now, obviously this morning, um, well, this officer's morning, it was um, a little bit congested with too many tasks. Now, getting too focused on the subject at hand can cause problems. Okay, this, obviously this officer was too task oriented. Um, he needs to allow for more time to accommodate um, 
a, a better relationship possibly with his offender. Tony and his group uh, point out a, a pretty prevalent factor about all of us is that we are task oriented. Uh, if, if we focus only on how to get the job done without focusing on other matters related to getting that job done, uh, we're leaving things behind and causing problems ourselves on occasion. Uh, demeanor has uh, much to do with that. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of us believe that uh, we, we can use our authority uh, to develop respect. Well, it depends on what you mean by that. I, I've heard officers tell me that uh, they are strict with their uh, uh, offenders or defendants, and that's how they get the respect. I, I submit to you that, that it is important for you to be firm when you need to be firm. But I think the fairness with which you uh, pursue uh, your uh, issues is important as well. I think uh, your professional approach to any kind of circumstance and you maintain a, a professional demeanor in the process gets you a, l a long way further than if you, you uh, acted on some of the emotions that might, uh, might arise. Now, the district, the uh, push to talk sites, I'm sure, are aware that uh, in certain circumstances you have experienced the emotions that, uh, that cause you to experience anger and those kinds of things, and you need to examine that and, and create techniques to, uh, to handle that sort of thing. I want to go to California with Bruce and his group and uh, illuminate on, on the matter of demeanor and what, what other kinds of considerations should we put into that. Art, we wanted to add the importance of, of the uh, nonverbal communication we have with the offender. We, we kind of always heard that 85% of what we communicate to someone is based on not what you say, but how you stand and how you present to that person. We also wanted to focus on the importance of, of focusing on what's important to the offender, whether we agree it or not. I think, as Connie said, it's important that we respect them enough that we, we do what we can to, to at least give them the impression of what they're saying is important during the visit. And it's absolutely vital because now you're getting them into the thinking mode, away from the anger, moving away from anger. And that's a skillful approach. That is a technique you can use. And, and it fits with a demeanor, a professional demeanor, because you're, you're being calm, because you, you're looking at it from a different angle and not in getting involved in the anger part of that. And that works so well. Uh, that that uh, we, we sometimes miss that because we get so involved in finishing the task and getting the job done. Uh, Jed, Tony, and Bruce's groups uh, have all uh, given us a, a layer upon layer of ideas with regard to uh, the, the demeanor. And we've heard a couple of references now, and I'd like to talk first to, to, to our panel about techniques and then go to the push-to-talk sites about what techniques they've uh, they have and, and uh, have experienced uh, and learned uh, through training uh, to help calm themselves and an offender under those high stress anger situations. Uh, Connie, can we hear from you? Sure. I'm sure it's uh, safety techniques, Art, that many people apply in the field or in the office. And it uh, would consist of refocusing, uh, finding again and knowing what is most important to you in your life. and whatever that may be, focusing on that. Uh, taking a breath is such a simple task, but just taking a deep breath for a second, helping you to think clearly again, um, just to take a moment out and reassess the situation just through a simple breath can do wonders. Uh, always keeping in mind, too, that the task that you're attempting to complete that day doesn't always have to be completed that day. If it means that your safety is in jeopardy, was, is that worth risking what's most important to you in your life? Again, refocusing. What do you want to do? For me, I want to go home at the end of the day. I want to maintain my family. Am I going to take unnecessary risks to jeopardize that? And in most of all the situations, the answer would be no. I'm not going to jeopardize that. Part of your duty is not to take a risk That's that right. would cr create harm to you. It's important that you be organized in, in that respect and to pursue that. Uh, Art? A couple of things I always try to emphasize, Art, with uh, officers in my district is that, you know, first of all, you have a plan. You know what you're trying to accomplish. You know what 
the goal of that home contact or that field contact is going to be. It shouldn't be something that's just random. And I like using the word random because in my mind, there is no such thing as a random contact or a routine contact, something that's uneventful because you don't know what could possibly happen. And the second thing I try to emphasize a lot is that you never have enough information about your offender or defendant that you supervise. Mm -hmm. I have people say, well, should I go back and get PSIs from 10 years ago? Is that too old? We don't need that information. I, I disagree. I think the more information we have about somebody, the better prepared we're going to be able to deal with that contact. So even this officer who was going in and trying to review his notes at the last second and not stopping to talk to a counselor to maybe rely on a treatment report that he had from three, four weeks ago and not know exactly what maybe happened in session yesterday, what anxieties this guy is feeling, what other issues have evolved in some of the counseling sessions that he may not be aware of, and not having that information handy for you when you're going in there to make that contact is definitely a dangerous situation. You bet. And that, that really points up to us how, how important it is for us to, to be aware of what we're doing and use techniques that we've learned, train ourselves for that. And you folks, Jed, uh, I, I want to ask your group, uh, are you aware of any techniques uh, to help calm yourself first and an offender or defendant in a high-stress, anger situation? Art, I think uh, we all agree that measuring your responses and not just shooting from the hip is probably a, a reasonable thing to do. In a, in a situation like this, uh, one of the techniques that can be used are negotiating skills and making the offender uh, believe or, or feel that they are a vital part of resolving this situation and, and uh, making it a win-win situation for, for both people. So uh, measuring resp your responses, uh, not shooting from the hip, and, and investing this person on getting the problem resolved is a, is, is a great technique to use in a situation like this. Investing. And not to uh, overreact to certain things. Investing in that kind of, of approach, a, a technique that, that allows the uh, offender or defendant to come to a thinking level, that's a, it's a great uh, kind of a way to get to that. Uh, it's, and if you can make that part of the skill, it's important uh, uh, that we do that. Uh, Tony, you and your group, uh, do you have any techniques? Or actually, I think the best thing to do in any type of confrontational situation is just to step back from the situation and just take a deep breath and just say, okay, let's relax. What's your problem? Discuss the problem at hand. See if you can come up with a resolution. If you can't, if they want to continue to get heated in an argument, you know, this isn't a fight. This isn't a, this isn't a fight we want to pick. And a famous person once said that he who angers you controls you. And in a situation like this, that would be so accurate and so true. So, you know, another officer um, on our panel actually mentioned that we stress professionalism all the time. However, professionalism done, does not necessarily mean that you have to wear a suit and tie. Okay? Now, let me elaborate on that. Wearing a suit and tie and looking professional is professional. That's what everybody likes to see. But do our offenders really... Um, rationalize do they relate to that type of to that type of environment no not really I mean most of the people that we deal with um, out in the field you know rarely do we wear ties and suits we dress appropriately um, but we want to be able to relate to them and to relate to their problems we want to take a laid-back atmosphere with them and again, verbal judo, verbal presentation, verbal skills. I think you can't train enough on those on those training issues like that. I mean, our district, not just our district, but our system in general, we always train. I think the most training that we have is firearms training. And simply because I think society in general tends to focus on negative situations, negative encounters. He who, he who angers you controls you. That's great. And, and all of the comments from your group uh, really appreciated. That kind of understanding, fundamental to what we do, is really important. We have to move along now. Uh, Bruce, you and your folks, uh, can you give us a quick uh, rundown on techniques that you have there? 
Art, we talked about watching your voice tone, uh, uh, opening up discussion with the offender and, and letting them know that it's to our mutual benefit to reach a, a settlement, which will be good for, for all of us. And we also talked about not getting hooked into the emotions of the offender, keeping objective. Okay, good. Thanks, Bruce. I want to, uh, you folks have all layered upon the issue. Uh, the, the various views and, and how it, how much depth there is in, in uh, the various things that go into to, uh, being a safe officer. Uh, I want the now because we we are uh, at uh, a point to wrap up the first scenario to ask uh, uh, Art to give us a, a review of what we what we've gone over. Art, you know, Art, one of the nice things about doing these kind of programs and dealing with officers who are experienced like this in safety is that I'm sitting here writing down some of the things that they're saying because they're things I haven't heard before and they're really good learning experiences. Um, some of the key points for this particular scenario was what is our personal mindset? You know, is that something we need to develop ourselves or is that something that can be taught? Distractions, I think they're a part of everybody's life. There's no way of getting around it, but the important key is to try and minimize them as much as you can. Uh, unpreparedness, we all saw what that could possibly do to you uh, in a situation if you're not prepared for an event. You know, have a plan, have a, a goal of what you're trying to accomplish. And this is something I'm going to take with me for a while that I really like that one, some, one of the officers said was a transition period. I really like that thought because when you think about it, how much can your mind process when you're sitting in the car looking at the file for two minutes and then dealing with the offender a minute later? You don't have a, a time to process all that information. So transition period is really good. Uh, knowing the history, knowing as much about an individual as you possibly can from the family to the defendant's behavior to his neighborhood to his culture, learning as much as you possibly can. Um, demeanor, knowing about courtesy and respect and treating people the way you want to be treated. And then finally, practicing good listening skills, letting the offender know that you're interested in his situation. He doesn't realize that you're dealing with 50 or 75 people at a time. All he knows is his issues, and he wants to be sure that you understand them and that you care enough to, to at least try and help him in his situation. So don't go there not knowing what's going on in his particular life. So some real good points that these guys had. I like them a lot. You can tell with just one scenario, uh, can bring up in terms of issues related to all of the things you need to be concerned with. It all goes into the fabric of, of what you're all about in terms of personal safety and things that you need to pay attention to and train yourself with because they're all tools. They are vital to anything that you're going to be doing in the safety arena. Well, with that, let's remember the principles that we've just learned and extrapolate them over to a two-person partner situation. Now, I, understand, I know that a lot of districts don't partner, but the, the safety concepts that come out of the discussion uh, can be used by uh, single officers, and it's important for us to uh, illuminate on some of the things because we do go to the field sometimes with other people. The considerations that go into that are much more elaborate than, than you might suspect. And, uh, and I know that the Push to Talk folks uh, have experience at this, and I know that uh, people, you people in the field are, are uh, experienced at this at various degrees, but uh, uh, it's going to be very helpful. So let's go to the next scenario now. If you're in a team, you have four eyes, and you're looking out for each other, you're also assessing an environment. I'm not on just a social visit with my field partner here that uh, we need to remember why we're out in the field here, why we're conducting a field visit, what the purpose of the field visit is, and try to keep it all in focus um, on why we're out there doing this job. Hang on a sec. So after this next visit, we have what? Three more to go? Yeah, uh, some of that, three more. But look, you have got to see this movie. It's great. I don't think so. I, I'm not all that into violent horror movies. Oh. I, I go to the show to be entertained, not scared to death. But come on, it's funny. You'll love it. Trust me. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> OK, so tell me more about this guy we're here to see. Certainly. Um, actually, however, it's not a guy. 
It's, um... Oh, would you look who's here? Hang on, this will only take a minute. Mrs. Davis! Mrs. Davis, good morning. Haven't seen you in a while. I've missed you. How have you been? Mr. Graves? That you? Mm-hmm. Hi. Uh, what are you doing here? Hello. Oh, Mrs. Davis, I'd like you to meet my partner, Beth Newfield. Miss Newfield, this is Mrs. Davis. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Davis. Nice to meet a friend of Mr. Graves. So, Mrs. Davis, um, you never answered my question. I seem to just keep missing you. Why is that? Well, you know how it is with work and whatnot. I'd explain, but uh, I don't want to keep you from your business. I'll call you later. Uh, well, you know, it just so happens that uh, Miss Newfield and I are running a little early this morning, so I have a few minutes. And since I haven't heard from you in so long, um, we can just stand here and chat, couldn't we? I'm not keeping you from anything, am I? Oh, oh no, not, not at all. I mean, uh... I'm busy, but I suppose I could spare a few minutes. Good, good. So uh, tell me, what have you been up to lately? Um, what's keeping you so busy at work? Boy, that's, a, that's an interesting set of circumstances. Uh, before we go to the Push to Talk sites, let me introduce the moderators in, in those districts that are participating. We have the Eastern District of Missouri, Ron Schweer, uh, familiar names coming up, Western District of North Carolina, Jeff Neighbor. And we had a problem with feedback on uh, Deborah Wojciechowski's uh, uh, district, uh, the District of Maryland. And Deborah, we didn't do this on purpose. We, ha we had to disconnect you because uh, we were getting some feedback. But I encourage your group now to give us some faxes with regard to your questions regarding this. It's important that we hear from you because you're prepared and you know what this is all about. We, we were counting on your participation. So if you could, uh, work through the fax system to get through to us, okay? Um, but what I'd like to ask the Push to Talk folks first at the outset is what are your observations regarding the safety issues here? I want to go first to Ron. Hi, Art. This is Ron. Uh, it's good always to see you, by the way. Um, our group here is, is discussing or has discussed a number of issues. Uh, first of all, communication between the field partners. Uh, our observations, uh, obviously, are that uh, there was a lack of uh, communication on who this third party was. Uh, also, the discussions leading up to the, uh, the contact with this third party focused on entertainment, et cetera, versus uh, discussions on, on the contact that was, that was forthcoming. Right on the money. Uh, it, it, it is clear to anybody watching from the outside, but we were task-oriented. And we weren't seeing these kinds of things in this scenario. Uh, and and be, that means that somehow uh, our mindset uh, didn't allow for us to be careful under those circumstances. We didn't react automatically. So let's go to uh, Jeff. Jeff, you and your folks. Good afternoon, Art. It's uh, good to see you again. Uh, one of the things that uh, we just discussed was the level of awareness the officers that were involved in the scenario and how um, it really changed quickly. And another comment was that um, the officer, uh, the male officer, seemed to be uh, hasty in, uh, in getting to the, the person uh, uh, that they confronted on the sidewalk. It's clear that uh, there, that the uh, person who we call a contact person uh, in any circumstance uh, was not considering uh, the totality of circumstances in the field. And it's one of the things that, that happens. And, and if uh, you aren't set ahead of time with proper training, that's going to happen. I want the, the people on the panel now to, to kind of flesh out some of their ideas regarding uh, partnering in this, uh, in this particular scenario and what, what happened here. Connie? Obviously, in this scenario, Art, there wasn't any preparation, which occurred be, should occur before the field contact. Obviously, the contact officer was very consumed with discussing a movie, and the cover officer attempted on two separate occasions to uh, intervene and uh, stop him from talking about the movie, which he continued to discuss with her. Uh, Again, they were in a, a surrounding that may or may not have been questionable. You, the risks always remain unknown. 
um, when they encountered this, was it the offender, was it the defendant, was it a third party? We don't know who it was. The, the object in the backpack, was that a weapon, was that not a weapon? Um, all those require pre-planning, pre um, and that's essentially through the simple form of communication. Uh, I think we're given a lot of tools to conduct this job, and all of uh, great help, being our firearm, our OC spray, uh, all the technological skills that we need. But sometimes I think we need to get back to the basics, which I'm glad we're doing this today, which is communication in order to prepare for a contact. Good foundation for you, Art. Sure is. Uh, I think some of the things that stand out the most is that, you know, these situations are reality. Uh, you know, even our, our best safety officers and, and the length of time they take to prepare for doing a contact, this could happen to somebody where you run into somebody on the street or when you're out socially or so on and so forth, and you have to be prepared for that type of situation. By him having little time to discuss it with his partners, even if he gave her an indication that A, it was a defendant that he was going to see, B, even a code word that they could have developed beforehand to let him, her know that there was a, you know, an issue with her or that there was uh, a danger in her background or a history of violence or something, just a code word to make her more familiar with the situation. She might have been able to do a better job as a cover person also. She had no idea in that contact whether it was a friend, whether it was somebody that he knew, you know, as an acquaintance or whatever, or whether that was a defendant that they were dealing with. So the lack of communication that Connie talked about, I mean, really put that cover officer and the officer himself in a in a uneasy or a dangerous situation. And the other thing that stood out I noticed too is that his his theory or his process of wanting to get that task done. He was so focused on it that he was losing sight of the fact that the defendant was a little uneasy, that she was starting to squirm around a little bit, she was trying to end the contact right then and there, and he was so task-oriented about, you know, you've got to come to the office, I haven't seen you, that he was losing sight of some of those other issues. So these, from both of your comments, uh, indicate that, that it, going to the field uh, as partners is more than just two people going to the field. There's a substantial amount of uh, considerations that have to be made and understanding established. I want to go to the push to talk sites. I want uh, you folks to uh, illuminate on this idea of uh, what we can do to improve a performance in this circumstance. Uh, rather than allowing this, this situation to occur in the field, what can we do to keep that from happening? Uh, Ron, let's go to your group first. Uh, thank you, Art. Uh we were discussing uh, some of the basics of safety, um, particularly uh, positioning, um, the hesitation by the third party, the escalation of the conversation, uh, and the like. Um, as far as uh, the officers communicating, a, a cover officer uh, has a responsibility to communicate with that primary contact officer, not just sit back and, uh, and let the uh, scenario unfold before them. It certainly won't, it could be something that they uh, will not like to encounter. Um, and if, there, if the primary contact officer in this instance isn't focused on that contact, that, that cover officer needs to help that person focus, bring to their attention that uh, we need to discuss issues regarding this case and, uh, and focus back on uh, why it is uh, that we're out there to begin with, what's the purpose of the contact. Ron and his group emphasized to us what, what's important in the communication process of partnering and it's important that we do that, but, but it doesn't come naturally. You have to train each other in communicating out there in the field. We talked about signals, we talked about various techniques to make sure we know that we're on the same page in every circumstance when we're out there together. That, that this communication has got to be automatic. That if we see some, our, our partner uh, con uh, conducting themselves in a certain way, that means something to us and that we both are on the same page. That's, that's good, Ron. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's, let's go to, uh, to uh, Jeff and his group. Uh, Jeff, can you illuminate any more on this, this issue? Yes, Art. Uh, one of the comments we had in our group uh, just a minute ago, uh, one officer mentioned that if we fail to plan, uh, then usually uh, we plan to fail. And I think um, that adds a lot to, to the second scenario today, uh, where it was obvious the two officers had no plan. 
um, maybe uh, using a code word uh, when something didn't look right, or even uh, to back up from there uh, when the officers were crossing the street, uh, just a quick sentence from the lead officer uh, to the other officer about what this contact was all about um, probably could have could have helped uh, quite a bit. Absolutely, Jeff. You folks uh, just uh, pointed a, a particular part that's very important in the process of partnering. Uh, and thanks a lot. What, what, uh, what just happened was a fax came in uh, from the District of Maryland. Uh, uh, nobody's going to shut out Deborah Wojciechowski, that's for sure. She and her group are, are uh, going to give us uh, their comments. And it's interesting how, uh, how trained minds go in the same direction. I, I need to read this to you because you heard this uh, from Connie and uh, the same kinds of things and, and from Art. Uh, the comment was there was no communication between the partners, uh, no code words. Uh, you heard us talk about that. Uh, the PO uh, viewed what might be a gun uh, and didn't alert the partner. Uh, we talked about that too. Uh, unaware who the third party was created problems. Um, and so these are, these are considerations that are common if you have the right mindset that, that pop up at you right away and, and, and doesn't allow you to get task oriented and miss these kind of high risk situations. Um, but one, I want to get into the partnering situation and ask you all, um, what are the benefits of partnering? Um, and, and let's go first to Ron and, and your group. Uh, what kinds of things that, the, that you know are, are beneficial because you partner? Thank you, Ari. Uh, the group is a consensus of this group that uh, the primary benefits would be it's a second set of eyes to uh, either scan the area for you or uh, focus on uh, areas of the party being contacted. Uh, it's also a, a, a second brain, a person that can uh, uh, interpret what those eyes see uh, and convey that information to the partner. Uh, benefits are, are phenomenal to have that partner there with you. Peripheral vision, it provides so much more in terms of uh, being aware of circumstances and, and producing uh, ideas with regard to uh, what's happening. Uh, great observation. Uh, let's go to Jeff, Jeff and his group. Art, uh, one of the comments here was that um, officers tend to be more investigative, uh, spend more time, uh, whether it's uh, uh, an employment check or a home contact and uh, Reiterating what Ron just said, uh, we look around a lot more uh, when we have someone else, another officer with us. Absolutely. Um, we, there, we have to be aware that, uh, that things are, people are around, uh, and that uh, cover person provides so much more and allows us to uh, relax a bit uh, and, and uh, be task-oriented because uh, they're watching our backs. Um, I want to talk, ask the panelists uh, how that uh, relates to individuals and, and what kind of considerations go into that as well, uh, as well as their observations regarding partners. I want to start with you, Art. I think there's clearly a lot of pros when you're talking about partnering. Um, there's definitely safety in numbers. Um, it allows you to um, develop a um, triangulation effect when you're dealing with an offender, which gives you a better oversight of what's going on during a contact. I think the quality of the home visit is greatly enhanced by having partners, not only from a safety standpoint, but from an investigative standpoint. You, as the contact person, I mean, your focus has to be on the offender. You're watching body language, you're watching mannerisms, you're watching his nonverbal cues. You have to focus on that. You're cover person, he's scanning the area. He's looking for those danger signs or clues that may, you know, give you some information for the next time you make a contact. But it also serves as an investigation tool, too. So the quality of that home contact is greatly enhanced by having a second person there with you. Connie? Or just to play devil's advocate, I think that we have to acknowledge that uh, there are many officers who work in rural areas. Um, even if you don't work in a rural area, uh, you may choose to go out into the field alone. 
if you're in a rural area, uh, you may not have an option to partner. Mm -hmm. And I think that people need to uh, look at how they conduct field work and say, do I really always go out into the field with my partner? Or do I have a partner who I go out with maybe 50% of the time? Because there's always those occasions that you might run up to the halfway house, um, you have an EM hookup, a lot of times a specialist is going to go on their own, um, or you're just running down to uh, the treatment center. A lot of it, those circumstances dictate you going alone. So in those situations, you become the contact officer and the cover officer. Um, I think um, you have to pay attention in those situations and apply the same techniques that we're talking about when you are alone out in the field. It, it, that points up how important it is if we partner to, to know that the benefits of partnering uh, also uh, place an obligation on us to use those same concepts when we're not partnering. One of the things that, uh, and we're going to be talking about the downside to partnering, one of the, the things that, that can cause risk for us is that we get too comfortable with p partnering and when we're alone, forget that we have to cover our own backs when we're alone and that we have to keep that in mind when we do that. I'm uh, advised that there is a fax that just came in and I'd like to throw it to Mark to let us know what that is about. Art, we've got a fax from Northern District of California, one officer from Oakland, one officer from San Francisco. One is Steve Sheehan from Oakland. And Rich, Rich, my, you're going to have to forgive me. I, I can't read the last name, and I don't want to butcher it. So Steve and Rich from Northern District, here we go. Would you have handled the situation differently, referring to the um, partnering situation we saw, if you are carrying a firearm? Let's, uh, go, to the, let's go to the Push to Talk sites first, and then because that's an important issue. Uh, to, to think about here. Um, so let's talk to uh, Ron first. Ron? Nothing like being put on the spot, but uh, I'd like to think that our officers uh, would handle the situation the best way possible, irrespective of being armed or not. We have uh, very few officers that are unarmed here, but uh, they don't rely on that firearm. Obviously, uh, our training is emphasizing uh, their mindset, what, what they look at, what they think, uh, and conveying that uh, uh, lower level of, uh, uh, how shall I say, intervention on the use of force continuum first. Um, as far as positioning goes, um, we noticed that the cover officer and, uh, was uh, near a wall, it appears. Uh, we uh, train our officers to use uh, any available uh, items in the area, trees, cars, poles, whatever, as cover uh, in a high-risk situation. But uh, given this uh, third party and the viewing of what could be uh, a weapon, um, I'd like to think that the officers would uh, communicate with that primary contact officer and try and get out of the situation before uh, potentially uh, resorting to the use of a firearm. See what training does for you. You don't have to think. You can be put on the spot and come up right where you need to be with regard to that issue. Um, that, that is, uh, thanks a lot, Ron. I, I can't emphasize enough. Uh, the presence of your firearm shouldn't change your consideration of the circumstances, I think. Uh, Jeff, do you agree? Yes, Art. Uh, Ron, Ron said it best in that uh, through uh, rehearsal and conditioning, and uh, putting ourselves in, uh, through this type of training or training that uh, that simulates what we've seen here today um, is is the best response, um, a, a preemptive response uh, if we run across a situation like this. Um, I, I don't think there should be a difference as to whether we're armed or we're not. Um, I think with proper planning again and um, with, with the planning uh, through training that uh, our officers should uh, have the ability to react safely in, in a situation like this. We all know in the, in the safety arena our firearms sh uh, shouldn't allow us to do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do uh, if we were not armed in terms of taking cover, in terms of uh, diffusing the circumstances. 
All of those things are important for us to consider under the circumstances. If it was a life-threatening situation, we have the tool to respond, and that, that's what the, that's all about. I want to turn to our panel now and, and ask uh, Art, uh, Art, what are your considerations regarding this? I think one motto that I always like to use is you never go into a contact or a situation armed that you would not go into unarmed, mm -hmm. okay? Your weapon doesn't make the difference whether that is safe or not, okay? It's the environment, it's the surroundings, it's the nature of the contact that will enhance or, or reduce what that risk is. Um, which brings to another question along the same lines is how much do you deal with, um, I lost my train of thought, with non-compliance issues when you're in the field? How much do you really deal with, in somebody's home, the fact that they've given you a dirty urine or the fact that they haven't been reporting uh, as they're supposed to, or in this scenario, out in the street like that? You know, was it safe to do it that way, or would it been better serve to just let the offender know that there's some things you need to discuss with him and you want to see him back in your office, which is a much more safer environment than out in his territory? I, I could see uh, heads around the country of uh, trained uh, officers who know that the firearm should not make a difference. And when you were saying those kinds of things, I could just see the heads going like this. Absolutely, that is that is essential that we understand that it's a tool that you use under specified circumstances, but it isn't an offensive tool and it isn't one that allows us to do things we wouldn't ordinarily do. I'll say that again and again. We have to emphasize that. And that's why you have to have that fabric put together tightly so that you know how to handle these things. Connie, can you add anything to our conversation with regard to this? There's been so many good comments, I think, made about it, particularly Ron by Art. And just to capsulize that, it's just, again, refocusing on, do I have another option here? Could an option be in this situation where having a code word already prearranged and possibly leaving the situation, like, hey, you know what, I forgot my checkbook. Whatever your code word might be, it could be something so simple, but it takes that preparation and planning to keep you and your partner safe. And that's important. That is very important for us to, to keep in mind. And again, I'll tell you that these kind of things don't just pop up. It comes from training and understanding fundamentally what you have to do. Uh, and, and what we're seeing now and hearing from the groups is that when you're out there with another officer, uh, it has to be established before you leave for the contacts. You have to have a training program of some understandings, common understandings amongst all officers. So if you change a partner, all, all of you have the same understandings with regard to communication. Uh, know the pages you need to be on when it comes to signals and those kinds of things. All of these take training. It is not something that just happens because you, you review a piece of paper. It's, it's, it's understanding is second nature to you. You know these officers, I'm not giving these push to talk folks a lot of time to consider these things, but they're whipping these things out because they've trained. They know these kinds of things. It's second nature to them and that's what you should consider doing for yourself. And so I, I'm under, I understand that we're, we're getting rained on by, uh, with uh, faxes and we need to get to some of those at least before the end of the program. So I wanna go over to Mark and, and have him tell us about one of the faxes, Mark. All right, here's a question for you and our sites in the panel with regards to the partnering issue. What should you do if you're with a senior officer and he or she has a different safety mindset, i.e. someone who's more relaxed than yours when you're out in the field? Uh, as the younger officer or the newer officer, I should say, how can you handle the different philosophies without challenging the senior officer's experience? Pretty touchy. Uh, let me go, I wanna go to the push to talk first because I know the panel has some uh, real concrete answers with regard to this and, and push to talk folks. I want, I want to go to Ron. Ron, you and your folks with regard to this situation. Well, Art, um, first of all, statistics bear out in the past at least that uh, the newer officers are the ones that are least ex assaulted in the field. And it's the older um, officers, years, officers with more years of experience that are assaulted more frequently. There's been discussion in the past about whether or not uh, um, tenure is a problem. Usually it's complacency, uh, according to our group here. And um, uh, a newer officer should ideally not fear saying something to their partner, uh, particularly related to their safety. Uh, obviously, if it's a partner that is not uh, in tune with uh, the surroundings or the safety issues at hand, then, then the primary contact officer's safety is going to be affected. Um, our group 
uh, believes that uh, the, uh, the officer with least seniority in this instance that you cite uh, should say something. Uh, consider repartnering with another person or if it is becoming a significant risk issue, terminate the contacts for the rest of the day, uh, go out another time with a different partner. Great observations. We, we uh, Ron and his group uh, put their finger right on uh, what's really important uh, for us to understand. Um, um, I want to go next to, uh, uh, to uh, Jeff and his group uh, in North Carolina. Jeff? And I agree with what Ron just said, and also, um, uh, again, I go back to our uh, conditioning and rehearsal through training. Uh, in this situation, um, if, uh, if we can train with the people that we work with, I think that that will really have a big impact on how we are going to work together in the field. And I'll leave my comments at that. We're, we're, what, what we're being told is, is uh, a subject matter that uh, requires uh, us to prepare ahead of time. I think that, that if we're going to talk to uh, another officer, we, we, it has to be a common ethic as part of what you do at the end of the day. That is, you, you debrief and talk about things openly and honestly. You're expected to do that, and so an, a newer officer will not feel constrained because, out of respect, out, out of a, uh, not wanting to offend a, a more experienced officer. If you make that part of the process and understanding that that's what you do at the end of the day if you have a question with regard to what happened out there, and, and then you, you come to better understandings, you educate each other and are more aware of what, what you're doing out there with each other. I'll go to the panel now and i ask them their views with regard to this kind of situation. Uh, Connie? All right, I first of all feel bad for this new officer in their position. It's very awkward. And I can state that because I've been in that position many, year, many years ago myself. Uh, I think something that is required comes from within, and it's courage. That uh, you recognize you're a newer officer and that you want to maintain a good relationship with the senior officer. And you want to maintain your safety. And I'm sure you don't want to upset the senior officer, but again, you may choose to go out in the field with them or you may elect not to. I think it could be um, a more effective technique to maybe put it back on yourself like, hey, I'm just looking for some advice here. Uh, could we maybe talk about how this played out? Uh, what would you recommend? Do you mind if, uh, what do you think about my opinion on this? Also educating that senior officer in the process. But at first it takes some courage to open those lines of communication. Good practical yeah. suggestions. Uh, in a minute or so, Art, can you tell us about your your view of this? Sure. It, it is a very touchy situation, and it should be handled delicately. But what you have to keep in mind is that an unsafe officer is putting someone else at risk also. Mm -hmm. You know, but what may affect me may not necessarily affect you. I may not feel the same sense that you do about a dangerous situation because for whatever reason, it doesn't have that impact on me. So maybe later on, after you've left the residence and you discuss, hey, you know, Art, this is what I saw when we were there. I felt really uncomfortable about this. You know, how did you feel? You know, bringing it to his attention, maybe something he wasn't even aware of, hopefully will, you know, ring a little bell in his head and say, hey, this was a, a dangerous situation. And if that doesn't work, uh, you know, confronting him may be an issue you might have to deal with or maybe even bringing it to your training officer, not in a sense of identifying something that somebody did wrong, but saying, hey, you know, look, this happened to me when I was in the field once. Can we bring this out in training in a future date so that maybe this person sees it up front and then maybe that'll generate some thought process for him that it was dangerous. Good technique for us to consider in providing ourselves a, a tool, but I think one important thing to do is, is to get these techniques and put them into a system of, of training so that everybody's on that page and understands these kinds of things work, uh, are, are expected and should done. We're told, I'm told that there's a fax we need to get into quickly, so let's turn to Mark and, and uh, get the fax in. Okay, Art, we've got one from our friends in Maryland, uh, Deb Wojciechowski and company, and they just, again, offered some comments to the, to the group in the discussion with regards to partnering. Talked about the benefits of partnering first. They list as, as, as uh, you have witness and you have verification, and then provides a double presence. 
and then if the offender is alone, it removes the PO from possible compromising situation. Uh, they list those as, as some of the benefits of partnering. Disadvantage, uh, partnering may provide a false sense of security, and it could also prevent, or provide rather, a distraction. Instead of uh, talk, talking with the supervising PO, the offender may now end up talking to the uh, cover officer. Great observations. What I want to do now is, is to move from that, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, things that all the push to talk sites, including uh, Maryland, uh, thank you very much, uh, your comments, to uh, wrap it up into a summary and, uh, of this particular section and then we'll close from there. So, Connie, can you give us a summary of what, what we just went through? And sure. Thanks, sir. Um, first of all, I want to thank all our Push to Talk sites, Ron and Jeff and Deborah. We really appreciate all your feedback. Um, I want to open it up with a comment from my friend Jeff here, which I think is so wonderful, and I've heard him state this before. If we fail to plan, we plan to fail. I think that is so wisely stated, and it really capsulizes everything that we're talking about today. And a lot of the points that our participants uh, brought up were Again, starting off with mindset and how critical that is. Partnering the pros and cons and deciding what is best for you. Uh, are you do you go out alone? Do you partner? Uh, have you ever thought about switching a partner and um, seeing what that new challenge is like? And again, communication. Uh, a lot of that is so simple and if we took the time to do it. And preparation, again, a lot of that can be conducted through allowing more time, through time management, organizational skills, and again, communication. Uh, it was also brought up uh, the role of the contact and the cover officer. What are the responsibilities of each of those roles? Again, can be addressed through communication. Uh, what if you are the contact and cover officer? You go out alone. You're playing both of those roles. Uh, Jeff also mentioned uh, rehearsal. Uh, when, when we train with people, we'll, we'll know what to expect when we're actually training with them. And also the point of debriefing, how critical that is. Great. That, that tells us, doesn't it, that uh, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. Because we can talk about debriefing all day long, which is essential to partnering. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what we've gone through. We've clicked off all of the summary points, and we have them available for you. What is really important here for you to understand is each of the topics our, push to, uh, talk, our groups have uh, given us are classes in and of themselves. But these classes are useless unless and until you make some personal commitments with regard to personal safety. Personal safety is your obligation to yourself, and if not yourself, to people who love you. With that, I'll turn it over to Mark. All right, thanks a lot, and thanks to you and to Connie and Dart Penny for giving us your time, talent, and expertise to make uh, today's broadcast possible. I want to thank all of our Push to Talk sites. Debbie, I'm sorry we lost you. I uh, would have loved to have heard you on the broadcast, but thanks so much for faxing your comments in, and thanks to the others for, again, making this, uh, I think, a very worthwhile discussion. Uh, our viewers who faxed in questions. And speaking of, I've got uh, time. I want to reference one other fax that we got, uh, not for the panel, but just for commentary, because I think it's, it's, it's important to mention. But let me mention before I do that, that we'd like to remind you that we've got some additional materials uh, at your site, so please continue. The discussions that we've started here, as Art in a way said, we've just touched on the tip of the iceberg. There's 90 minutes of discussion here, two scenarios. There's a myriad of issues uh, associated with safety that we didn't even, we couldn't even touch on. And uh, so continue these discussions, use these these uh, scenarios, these videos, the, the, these, these uh, safety programs we're doing, um, in district training, brown bag presentations so you can have discussions, wrap it into other existing safety training that we know so many of you have got in place in your districts now from scenario-based to lecture-based to uh, running safety academies. But um, before I conclude, let me take a minute to reference this particular fact because I think it's interesting and I think it speaks to the passion and the sincerity with which a lot of folks in the field uh, feel about this topic. It's from Craig Bruner. Craig is a senior USPO uh, and firearms instructor and, and DATS officer from Tallahassee, Florida. And without reading the whole thing, because Craig had a lot to say, um, Craig wanted to emphasize from our first scenario that what really should have been discussed from a safety perspective 
was things like the poor driving skills, taking a beverage while on the road, reading a file, grabbing for documents, using the cell phone. I think Bruce Vasquez's group referenced this issue of cell phone and the hands-free thing. So, Craig, I, I think that was addressed at least on that aspect. He says, the chances are if an officer gets injured, it might be or will be driving a car. I think it's a great point, Craig. And um, granted, it, it wasn't as much a part of the discussion. We touched on a few issues, but I still think you bear out the fact in that that there are other things that need to be discussed in this topic. And uh, some are going to feel that some of the issues we hit aren't as important as what you just mentioned, Craig. Another thing you mentioned, and really well dealt with environmental awareness, the officer in the scenario, the first scenario, was not aware of his circumstances and surroundings when in the parking lot. He allowed his back to be turned to the stranger. He did not appreciate the possibility that the stranger could have had serious mental health problems, been affected by mind-altering substances, or had a weapon. Again, all valid and uh, on-target points. And again, I'll go back to what my colleague Art anyway just said. We just hit the tip of the iceberg. Craig, you went a little deeper with, with the iceberg on this, and I think you hit some really valid points, things that are, that are additional food for thought. Thank you for your candidness. Thank you for your honesty with regards to this discussion. And having said all that, I want to thank all of you again, and please, as always, enjoy the rest of your day.